We've discussed just how powerful and amazing amphibians are in the wild, which inspired two amazing lines of Pokemon. But what happens when these webbed-footed warriors are raised alongside humans, and just exactly how does it affect both of us? Welcome back, trainers, to the Ranger Base. I'm Ranger Rai, and this is the third and final part of my series, Amphibians, Warriors of Nature. If you're new to the channel, it would be really awesome if you liked, shared, and commented on this video. And while you're in the comments, why don't you let us know which Pokemon line you would like to see covered next. I really enjoy making these videos for you guys, and I've had so much fun on this little journey that we've had together, and I hope we can keep having more. Now, we have a lot to unpack in this video, so I would like to get through the Pokemon breakdowns a little bit quickly. We've talked about the Krogonk line and their dangerous toxins, as well as their distant cousins within the Seismitoad line and their powerful, earth-shaking vibrations. But now, we will break down the third amphibian Pokemon and perhaps one of the most powerful. It's the Greninja line. Hopping right into this line's origins is the Bubble Frog Pokemon, Froakie. This line has the incredibly unique ability to produce a bubbly texture known as Frubbles to attack, trap, and disrupt enemies. These Frubbles are inspired by the foaming protective egg nests of the Tungara Frog and, especially, the Gray Foam Nest Frog, the latter of which seems to be the biggest inspiration for Froakie's design. While both produce foam when building their nest, the Gray Tree Frog build their nest in thicker foam that hangs from trees, and these nests look exactly like Froakie's Frubbles. How crazy is that? Froakie is also known to use these Frubbles to make sort of a makeshift mask, with the ones on its back resembling a cloth bag similar to a thief, or specifically in Japanese culture, a Dorobo. This ties in perfectly with this Pokemon line's overall sneaky theme. As its training progresses, Froakie has increased its abilities and developed into a truly skilled sneak, growing in size and power to become Frogadier. There isn't a whole lot that's changed between Frogadier and its previous form, aside from its size, but it did gain two things worth talking about, its head and its feet. You might notice that its head has these dark blue sections. While it's more or less a preview of its final form's colors, the color placement does resemble a mask worn by a thief or a ninja to conceal its identity. A very nice design detail. But it's Frogadier's feet that have the coolest design inspirations, as their shape now allows them to walk on water. The shape of its webbed feet are similar to that of Mizu Gomo, a tool that ninja were believed to have used to skim across the surface of the water. The success of them varies from story to story, however. This is an excellent design choice, and shows off just how far this Pokemon has come along in its efforts to become a true master of the stealthy arts. And if you want to become a master of the follower arts, then make sure you're subscribed, and give this video a like and a share. Also, which water starter do you think is the best designed? Let me know in the comments below, and we just might have to do a video on it. With its time spent honing its skills to their highest potential, Frogadier will reach the final stage in its natural evolutionary line, becoming Greninja. There is so much to discuss with this starter, and I specifically want to address the most drastic change, its very long scarf. It's actually Greninja's tongue that wraps around itself like a scarf. This might be seen as pretty disgusting, but it actually makes a lot of sense compared to the previous two amphibian species that we've discussed. Krogunk is known for its volatile toxins. Seismitoad can bring down large structures with its powerful croaks and vibrations, so that would leave Greninja to be the most agile of these species. Its long and powerful tongue is designed after the tropes in TVs and movies of ninjas wearing a scarf as both a type of mask and a sort of tail. In reality, it's really just for style more than anything else. However, there is one use that this scarf and tongue do share, and that's the belief that the scarf would be used as an extra sort of grapple hook, which makes a lot of sense for Greninja specifically. Most frogs and toads have long and powerful tongues that they use to snatch up food like insects in just an instant. So why not allow this Pokemon to grab onto ledges from a faraway distance? One of the most common and necessary tools for a ninja or shinobi to have is a grappling hook. Along with several other necessary tools, the grapple hook is one of the most important, so it only makes sense for Greninja to have one, or something similar, on it. Greninja is also known to have access to the exclusive move, Water Shuriken. 
similar to the real shuriken or ninja stars that most westerners tend to call it. Physically, Greninja's color is in the same bluish range of both Krogunk and Seismitoad, and these circles on its body are leftover glands that a lot of frogs and toads have, which I explained a lot more in the Seismitoad video. Previously, I explained that unlike the Krogunk or Seismitoad lines, Greninja is not based exclusively on an amphibian in the wild, but instead on one that's been raised in captivity and is heavily influenced by human nature. In fact, this human influence helps push Greninja to its peak potential. And it all begins with an iconic Japanese story called The Tale of the Gallant Jiraiya. It's so good. In this story, our hero faces so many challenges, faces magic, and even battles a huge- Wait, 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 you know what? I think this story would be better if told by someone a little more qualified. Which is why I asked two of the best storytellers that I know to spin you the tale. Let me introduce you to Plus Ultraman and Ronin Charizard. Yo trainers, and thanks Rai for having us. Members of the Ranger base. Thank you for having us. Glad to have you guys here. Hey, uh, Plus, would you like to start things off? Sure thing, I suppose that'd be pretty fitting. It's important to know that the original full version of the tale of Jiraiya the Gallant is much longer and a bit more complex in its storytelling. There is, however, a retelling of the story that is more well known and follows more of the story that we are much more familiar with. The tale starts with Jiraiya's father, who was a castle lord, being killed during one of many civil wars. After he is slain, young Jiraiya is hidden by a guard and is able to escape, but they are attacked by a band of robbers, and the guard is killed after resisting. Jiraiya then goes to a place called Echigo, where he would then spend the rest of his childhood, now left a wanderer, spending his life in several provinces, but always wishing to restore his family name. Since he was talented at swordsmanship and was exceptionally brave, Jiraiya soon became a chief of his own band of robbers, where he would sneak in disguise to the places he robbed to learn where their treasure was stored. He would then come back later and rob them. Is it my turn? Well, okay. One day, Jiraiya heard of an old man who lived in the mountains and decided to go rob him. During the journey, he was beset by a great snowstorm and he took refuge in a small house that he happened upon. Inside was a beautiful woman who treated him with great kindness. This did not change Jiraiya's nature as a robber though, and after midnight, he went to kill her with his sword while she was reading. However, in a flash, her body changed to a very old man who grabbed the heavy steel blade and easily broke it into pieces. He then announced his name and that he is a giant frog that has lived on this mountain for hundreds of years. He pardons Jiraiya after telling him he could kill him easily and then teaches him magic arts. Jiraiya stayed with the frog for several weeks learning the magic arts of the mountain in order to control the weather as well as control frogs and change their shape and size at will. After his teachings, the frog forbids him from robbing or injuring the poor and helpless, and instead take from those who use and acquire money dishonestly and to help those in need and suffering. He then turns into a giant frog and hops away, sort of like a magical Robin Hood if you will. After a while, Jiraiya has developed a bit of a reputation, so much so that whenever someone was robbed, they claimed the young thunder was here, which is actually the direct meaning of the name Jiraiya. Also a little fun fact for you, the name Rai in Japanese can mean trustworthy, lightning, or thunder. Just a little factoid that makes our amazing host all the cooler in my opinion. Anyway, during this time when Jiraiya was helping the poor and needy, a young maiden named Tsunade was meeting her own magical instructor. Long story short, an old man offers to teach her powerful slug magic, which she agrees to and trains hard in, eventually mastering said magic. She was then advised to use her powers to defend the poor and destroy wicked robbers, and to join her pals with Jiraiya in the form of marriage. Then, as one does, the old man turns into a snail and crawls away. Tsunade then remarks that she and Jiraiya with the combination of slug and frog magic would be able to destroy a robber named Uruchimaru, who was the son of a serpent. Unfortunately, a lot of things happen after this, but the most important things that you need to know is that a large war broke out not long after Jiraiya and Tsunade got married. Orochimaru uses a powerful poison to try and kill Jiraiya and Tsunade. One of his protégés goes off to get them a cure. There's a lot of marriage drama as well. This story is surprisingly heavy on the romance drama than actually fighting, but it does end in a very important way. As once Jiraiya and Tsunade are healed, another war had broken out with all three powerful masters of frog, slug, and snake magics battle, using a special sword to remove the evil from Orochimaru and finally living in peace. This is definitely a complex story, and, and, and I for one may get why you're bringing this up, but it, it may help everyone else if you explain what exactly this has to do with Greninja. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the story said that Jiraiya was using frog magic the whole time, and ninjas weren't magicians. Unless we're talking about the Naruto version of ninjas. 
Believe it or not, but a lot of what you guys read lines up perfectly with Greninja's design, mostly due to its unique ability. I'm sure you know it. In the story, Jiraiya is described as a robber or thief, which might seem like a simple burglar, until you remember that ninjas weren't elite assassins or masters of stealth when they were first starting out. As many were simple farmers turned thieves and possibly paid killers, later developing their skills and being dubbed ninjas or shinobi. Similarly, Jiraiya and the others had to train in their new abilities and skills to eventually become masters, with all three eventually having control over their respective animal magics. If we compare the training and mastery of these animals to another process we call domestication, we can actually begin to see how the cohabitation of previously wild animals with humans actually helps bring out more of their hidden potential. The biggest example is the domestication of wolves. Over the course of many centuries of domestication, wolves and similar canine breeds became more docile and responsive to humans. They were eventually able to learn and be taught new skills well beyond an animal's natural intellect and ability to learn. There are many cases of other animals having greater spikes in intelligence from human interference, and when compared to the cohabitation of Jiraiya and his mastery over toads, we begin to see a connection. Tying all of these factors together leads us to the ultimate case of this with Greninja's special ability, Battle Bond. This is a super special ability, as it can only occur between a Greninja and a trainer that it has bonded with, giving it a tremendous power boost and even a new appearance inspired by its trainer. This is where we get the ultimate mixing of ninja culture, domestication, cohabitation, and mythological influences for this Pokemon creating one of the most powerful amphibian Pokemon around. Wow, sometimes you forget just how deep Pokemon designs can go, and how many different places, mythologies, legends, folk tales, and all the other stuff they can be inspired by. It's honestly a shame that the anime or the series in general honestly doesn't get enough time to go super in depth with these things, but I guess that's what we're here for. No doubt. But wait, what about Greninja's hidden ability, Protean? Of course, I didn't forget it. Even without Battle Bond, Greninja is still pretty powerful with its hidden ability, Protein. This allows it to change its typing to match the move it previously used, something it more than likely gets from both frogs and ninjas. Frogs are incredibly versatile, as we've explored through this entire series, being able to adapt to many different environments and even changing their body chemistry due to the foods they eat similar to Greninja changing its types on the fly. And just like ninjas, they need to be versatile in their skills, being able to don disguises, weapon abilities, and to adapt to different food and environments just as quickly. So this hidden ability reflects its ninja roots perfectly, as well as being a perfect example of the connections between the Pokemon world and the real world. Thanks so much for watching, and a big thanks to Plus Ultraman and Ronin Charizard for stopping by and spinning the incredible tale of the legendary ninja Jiraiya. Hi, thanks for having us. I love learning about the deeper inspirations of the Pokemon world. And how can I pass up a chance to tell these wonderful trainers about such a cool legend like Jiraiya? It's not the first time I've done so either. That's right! You can find some excellent stories on both of their channels linked in the description below, including What If Jiraiya Adopted Naruto, and their impressive What If Giovanni Sponsored Ash collaboration on both of their channels. It is such a good story and I'm heavily invested. We'll see you guys next time, and as always, keep, keep exploring, exploring trainers! trainers.